India has been and remains one of the most religiously diverse regions in the world. Even a relatively unitary category like Hinduism, known internally as Sanatana Dharma, is really more of an umbrella term for a whole variety of different religious traditions. The philosophical or theological system known as Vedanta is one of the most significant aspects of this wider religious tradition of Hinduism. It took sacred scriptures like the Upanishads, the Brahma Sutras, and the Bhagavad Gita and created a very sophisticated system of scriptural exegesis that has become famous to this day. In a previous episode, we've already talked about the great uh, Vedantic scholar Shankara and his school of Advaita Vedanta, or non-dual Vedanta. Today, we will continue that story by exploring another sage and scholar within the larger uh, tradition of Vedanta, uh, a philosopher who has become perhaps the most significant for the devotional side of Hinduism generally, a fascinating sage by the name of Ramanuja. Ramanuja is a historical figure of great renown in the Hindu traditions of India. His philosophical system, known as Vishishtadvaita Vedanta, came to play a central role in the history of Sri Vaishnavism, which is the school devoted to worshipping Vishnu as the supreme god, and which has perhaps been the majority form of at least devotional Hinduism for most of history. Ramanuja belongs to the philosophical tradition of Vedanta, and much of his ideas and philosophy is in direct response to Shankara and his Advaita Vedanta. So in order to be able to fully grasp and appreciate the points made in this video and the points made by uh, Ramanuja himself, I highly recommend and suggest you go and watch some of my previous episodes on Vedanta and on, on Shankara in particular before you watch this one and then come back to this one. Now, the life of Ramanuja is, as usual, hard to get at with certainty. Just like with Shankara, the biographical material we have comes from hagiographies and should be read with a healthy level of skepticism. But as always, situating a person in his environment is very helpful in order to grasp his ideas and their context more properly. These traditional accounts tell of how Ramanuja was born into a Brahmin or priestly family in southern India, close to the modern city of Madras, which is also known as Chennai. His birth year isn't necessarily agreed upon, but with the traditional accounts placing it in 1017. There are others who I believe it may have been around the year 1077, but we can at least be pretty certain that he lived during the 11th to 12th centuries. Ramanuja appears to have grown up in a Tamil environment that was strongly infused with devotional fervor for the god Vishnu, represented for example by the so-called Alvar saints, who were poet saints of southern India who expressed a strong devotion or bhakti towards Vishnu in particular. This environment seems to have strongly influenced Ramanuja's religious and philosophical leanings, as we will see. In any case, he is said to have started to study Vedanta at some point under a teacher called Yadava Prakasha, who had a very strong leaning towards the Advaita or non-dual interpretation of Shankara in particular. Being a very gifted man already in his youth, Ramanuja is said to have disagreed with his teacher on a number of points. He disagreed with the impersonal static view of God or Brahman expressed in Advaita Vedanta, preferring instead a more personal God that could be worshipped. One story tells of how Ramanuja began to cry as Yadava Prakasha offered a Upanishadic interpretation that seemed, in a classic non-dualist term, to equate the Brahman with created things, like monkeys, in this particular case. When the teacher confronted him, Ramanuja offered a counter-interpretation that retained the transcendence of the Brahman. These tensions between the teacher and student eventually led to their split, Ramanuja going his own way, basically. Um, there are even stories of how the teacher, Yadava Prakasha, uh, attempted to have Ramanuja murdered at some point, which tells us that the tensions were probably pretty high. 
Later, Ramanuja instead became associated with two other teachers, Yamuna and Mahapurna, both associated with the Vaishnavite tradition of bhakti devotion, and he was eventually initiated into Sri Vaishnavism himself. He then became a significant authority figure within the larger Vaishnavite community at the time, serving as priest in several important Vishnu temples around India, particularly in southern India. He seems to have caught the attention of a lot of people due to his intellectual capabilities. He seems to have been a very gifted man. Um, he seems to have also caught the attention of people because he appears to have um, criticized or been critical towards certain aspects of the caste system. There are stories of how Ramanuja would um, treat people of the lowest caste, the Shudra caste, on equal terms. Um, which was pretty unusual at that time, especially, and also that he taught that anyone who showed sincere devotion to Vishnu, regardless of caste, uh, could reach uh, liberation, which was also quite an unusual teaching at that time. Like so many others of his kind, including Shankara, as we saw, it is told how Ramanuja, when he wasn't busy being a priest in one of the Vishnu temples, would travel all around India seeking philosophical or, or spiritual knowledge and also debating people from opposing uh, philosophical schools. Of course, the tradition also tells us how he completely defeated uh, all of them uh, with his skills in rhetoric and, and our argumentation. During his life, Ramanuja managed to leave a lasting mark on the history of Hinduism. Just like with his birth, the date of his death is somewhat contested, but the traditional account is that he lived between 1017 to 1137, which would have made him 120 years old by his death. There are more conservative estimates by modern scholars who suggest that the years 1077 to 1157 might be more accurate for his life. In any case, he seems to have definitely lived a long life, uh, regardless of which of these uh, perspectives you choose to, to uh, believe in. And in that very long life, he showed his intellectual skills by writing many uh, works or treatises and books on uh, the philosophy of Vedanta, on Vedantic philosophy. Just like all other such philosophers of that school, the majority of those texts include commentaries on the core text of Vedanta. So he wrote, for example, a commentary called the Bhashya on the Bhagavad Gita, and also what is probably his most important and famous work, which is known as the Sri Bhashya, which is a commentary on the Brahma Sutras. And all these writings really reflect the general mission and purpose of Ramanuja's whole career, basically. That is, the harmonization of the bhakti tradition of devotion to Vishnu, uh, which was so popular particularly in southern India at this time, with the Upanishads, the, the great Vedic texts, and their exegetical tradition, in other words, with Vedanta. The philosophical or theological tradition of Vedanta is primarily concerned with three core texts. Firstly, there's the Upanishads, which is usually considered a part of the larger uh, corpus of the Vedas. There is also the Brahma Sutras, which is a kind of commentary on the Upanishads. And then lastly, there is the very famous Bhagavad Gita, which features the god um, Krishna and his dialogue with the warrior Arjuna. For those of you who ignored my earlier suggestion to check out the earlier episodes first, we could say that these primary textual sources, and thus Vedanta as a philosophical tradition, is primarily concerned with a few different concepts and their relationships to each other. Perhaps the most central of these is the concept of Brahman, which is conceived of as the absolute reality that underlies all of the universe. All pervading, one and ineffable, the Brahman is not only the center point of existence, but also of Vedanta. There is also the important concept of the Atman, or self, both in terms of a universal kind of self above all individuality, but also the individual selves or souls of human beings, more commonly called the Jiva or Jivatma. Now these concepts, so Brahman, Atman, Jiva, etc., are always very central aspects of Vedanta, but different schools interpret their relationship in different ways. As we saw in the episode on Shankara and Advaita Vedanta, this school interprets the text in non-dual terms. The Atman, the individual selves and really all of the world, is identical to the Brahman. 
they are the very same thing, and all appearance of multiplicity or difference is the result of ignorance, known as avidya, and of illusion, called maya. While being highly influenced by it, Ramanuja is highly critical of Shankara and other proponents of Advaita Vedanta, or non-dualistic Vedanta, who argued for the absolute identity of the individual self and the Brahman, or absolute reality. This approach, he felt, rendered devotional practice unnecessary, which was unthinkable to him. Instead, Ramanuja tries to show how the Upanishads and the Bhagavad Gita really argues that bhakti, or devotion, is the true path to liberation. And to do so, he needs to present a quite different interpretation where he diverges from the interpretations of Advaita on a number of central points. And it is thus to the ideas and teachings of Ramanuja that we now turn. As I have already mentioned, the philosophical system that he is associated with is called Vishisht Advaita, which is usually translated as qualified non-dualism, as opposed to just Advaita, which simply means non-dualism. As the name suggests, Vishisht Advaita takes some of the basic features of Advaita and retains a certain form of monism or non-dualism, but modifies it in ways that allows for a more personal relationship and approach to God and worship. In Vishishta Dvaita, the concept of Brahman, or absolute reality, is directly identified as Vishnu, or Narayana, the supreme god of Vaishnavism. Thus, Ramanuja denies the Advaitic concept of Nirguna Brahman, that is, Brahman without attributes. Instead, he argues that Brahman, or Vishnu, in other words, is ultimately a personal deity with attributes, sometimes known as Saguna Brahman. It is very important for Ramanuja to uphold the relevance of personal worship and thus to retain a transcendence of God from human beings. For this reason, he also rejects the non-dualist claim that the world of multiplicity and change is the result of avidya, or ignorance, or maya. Instead, Ramanuja is a realist. The created world, including the diversity and multiplicity within it, is essentially real. Quote, Next to the assertion that all difference presented in our cognition, as of jars, pieces of cloth, and the like, is unreal because such difference does not persist, this view, we maintain, is altogether erroneous. In other words, the world and the individual self, the Atman, is not identical to the Brahman. Each self is an individual self with a consciousness of his own. Ramanuja divides things into three essential and distinct categories, achit, which is non-conscious entities and objects of perception, in other words, matter, basically. Then there's chit, which is conscious individual selves or souls. And lastly, there is Brahman, who is also identified, as we saw, as the god Vishnu or Narayana. As we can see already, Ramanuja maintains a clear distinction between god and the world or individual selves. Uh, but at the same time, to him, God is also the underlying reality of all that exists. It, God is kind of their very substance. But as opposed to Advaita Vedanta, which posits that the Brahman and the individual self or the world is completely identical to each other, being no difference at all, to Ramanuja instead, the individual self or the world could be seen as God's body, and God being the soul which controls that body. In the words of C.J. Bartley, quote, The scriptures, correctly interpreted, uh, definitely state that the conscious and non-conscious entities, in all their states as subjects and objects of experience, are ensouled by the supreme person who is their underlying reality and incapable of existence independently of him. This is because they are controlled by the supreme person insofar as they constitute his body. The supreme person of whom the conscious and non-conscious substantial entities are existentially dependent modes, since they constitute his body, exist imminently in the form of the universe in its potential and actual conditions. Chit and achit entities are real and identifiable only by virtue of being modes of the Brahman. In other words, the world and its conscious and non-conscious entities are in God and are entirely dependent on him for their existence, but are not completely identical to him. He remains transcendent and beyond the limitations of created things, while also remaining their very underlying reality and substance, what some would call a kind of panentheism. This is what Ramanuja himself has to say in the Sri Bhashya, quote, 
Any substance that a conscious entity can control and support entirely for its own purposes and whose sole essence is to be an ancillary to that entity is its body. Therefore, all conscious and non-conscious entities are the body of the Supreme Person since they are controlled and supported by him entirely for his own purposes and their sole essence is to be his ancillaries. So there's no maya or grand illusion according to Ramanuja, no avidya or ignorance that causes us to misunderstand the realities of things. The world is real, um, and it is different from God, who still remains the world's underlying reality. In fact, he very harshly criticizes the idea of avidya or ignorance that the uh, Advaita Vedantins so, uh, hold on so dearly to, he sees it as completely contradictory. If it is true, as they say, that everything is completely identical to the Brahman, then where does ignorance come from? That means that ignorance must be part of the Brahman if everything is identical to the Brahman, and so that would uh, neglect or compromise the perfection uh, of the Brahman, which is part of, of one of its uh, one of the ways that it is described. It's it's co it's complete. It can have no it can have no imperfections basically. And so he very cleverly argues that the idea of avidya goes against the very foundational ideas of what the Brahman is supposed to be, and thus the Advaitins, according to him, they self contradict themselves. Ramanuja instead seeks to find a solution where God is unified and one with creation or with the world, but that he still remains unaffected by its corruptions. And this is why the metaphor of the soul body relationship works so well here. It is interesting that Ramanuja is working from the very same sources. He's reading the same text that the Advaitins are reading, but he's interpreting them in completely different ways. It's a good example to show how texts bear very little meaning without an external person who interacts and interprets those texts. Indeed, when we read texts like the Upanishads, at least from a certain perspective, they can appear to contradict themselves. There are sections that certainly appear non-dualistic or as monistic, and those of course are the sections that people like Shankara hold on to so dearly, but at the same time there are examples of other sections that give us a completely different view of reality, sometimes much more theistic and, and dualistic, etc. Ramanuja recognized these seeming contradictions and tried to offer an exegesis that took all of the different aspects into consideration. The seemingly non-dual sections can be harmonized with more theistic expressions in a grand system that incorporates all of these perspectives. And this is Ramanuja's Vishishta Dvaita, or qualified non-dualism. Now, even though Ramanuja clearly disagrees with Advaita Vedanta on a number of points, he's definitely inspired by earlier writers like Shankara and does indeed share some of their ideas. He agrees with them in stating that the only true means of true knowledge, in terms of ultimate truths of the Brahman, uh, which is also known as the pramana, uh, means to knowledge, is sacred scriptures, that is the Vedas, Upanishads, Bhagavad Gita, and the Brahma Sutras. Quote, because Brahman, being raised above all contact with the senses, is not an object of perception and the other means of proof, but to be known through scripture only. But in many other respects, as we have seen, his positions are very different, and all of this stems obviously from his strong insistence on retaining the importance of prayers and personal worship, devotion, bhakti, in other words, to a deity, to a personal god with attributes. He felt that the system of Advaita Vedanta made prayers and rituals useless, because if we are identical to God, if I am God, what's the purpose of praying to God? For all of Hinduism in general, and therefore also for Vedanta in particular, the ultimate goal of life in general is to reach moksha, in other words, liberation from the constant cycle of rebirths that the soul uh, goes through. And in Advaita Vedanta, the path to liberation that is most emphasized, the one true path in, in, in a sense, to this liberation is what is known as jnana yoga or the yoga of knowledge. What this means is that in order to reach liberation we are to reach knowledge of our true selves. We have to recognize uh, and realize that our individual self is a form of illusion, that my true nature is identical 
to the Brahman, to absolute reality. There is no difference between us and all experience of difference between myself or anything and the Brahman, any appearance of multiplicity is a, a misunderstanding. It's a superimposition that is ultimately not real. So to reach liberation, according to Advaita Vedanta, is, to, is through reaching knowledge of this essential reality of ourselves. But Ramanuja and Vishishta Dvaita disagree with this. The only true path to liberation for them is Bhakti Yoga, the yoga of devotion. It is not by reaching knowledge of our true selves that we are liberated, but through the grace of God, or Vishnu, as a result of our sincere devotion to him. Quote, it was also shown that knowledge, vision, and the attainment of the Lord can be had only through one-pointed and absolute devotion. This devotion is to be done through things like prayers, offerings, and the many rituals performed in the temples dedicated to the gods, such as puja, the famous ritual when food and other items are offered to the image of a deity. A general personal piety and devotion directly to Vishnu as a deity with attributes filled with love and grace that can be bestowed upon the worshipper. Indeed, Ramanuja was, after all, a priest in an important Vishnu temple, and we see him strongly incorporating that into his reading of the Upanishads. It is also for this reason that he rejects the idea of the attributeless Brahman so emphasized by Advaita. Brahman is not static, but a personal deity with attributes who controls the world as his body. Quote, All things in the world, whether they are or are not, are Vishnu's body, and he is their soul. Just like the body and soul are intimately connected and unified, the body being dependent on the soul, so the world is unified to and existentially dependent on Vishnu or Narayana. And just as it is the duty of the body to obey and serve the soul, so it is the duty of us as creatures to serve God. The individual selves of the world are not totally unified as a single consciousness, their individuality being illusions, but independently distinct selves, albeit all being part of the self of God, or modes, or outer expressions of that God. It's hard to talk about the Ramanuja in this way without making constant comparisons and references to other schools of Vedanta, primarily Advaita, but this is because so many of Ramanuja's ideas are in direct response and in conversation with that school. I could sit here all day and point out the different particularities of philosophical doctrines where he differs from other schools, but I think the aspects that we have talked about so far make up the core features and characteristics of his system and how it fits into the wider tradition of Vedanta. The influence of Ramanuja has been immense. Arguably, in the history of Hinduism, he managed to surpass Shankara in terms of influence. By taking the popular devotional tradition of Vaishnavism, that form of religious practice so popular among the majority population, and giving it a firm philosophical, theological, intellectual, and scriptural basis grounded in the Vedas, he created an incredibly successful and lasting school of thought that has remained one of the cornerstones of Hindu devotion to this day. Vaishnavism and Hinduism wouldn't be what it is without the influence of Ramanuja. He might not be as famous as Shankara. Advaita Vedanta and Shankara, after all, has become very famous in the Western world as one of the, the, the most uh, featured aspects of the category of Eastern wisdoms. But in native India, Ramanuja and his Vishishta Advaita has provided a theistic form of devotional practice that is still also very strongly connected to the philosophical um, sophistication and argumentation of Vedanta. He is often called the single most important thinker in all of devotional Hinduism. For these reasons, Ramanuja should definitely be considered one of the most significant and important thinkers in the history of the world. His intellectual brilliance reaches us even today when we read his works. Just the fact that he challenged the great Shankara and in the process managed to actually give him a run for his money should be enough to merit our admiration. I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you want to support this channel and its attempts to give you uh, scholarly and academic uh, content about the world's different religious traditions, you can support us on Patreon through a monthly donation. Special shout out to CCB6B3252EE33C84. Thank you for making me say that out loud. Or through a one-time donation on PayPal.
Um, and you can also, of course, just like the video, subscribe to the channel, and keep the discussion going in the comments. And I'll see you next time.